that you would just bring to our hearts the knowledge of your word, that you would show us and teach us, Lord, and that you would apply your word to our life, that we could learn of you and know you in a greater way. And so we ask that even now you would teach us as we gather together, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We're in Isaiah chapter 65, and as we look at this portion of Scripture, we see the Lord talking to his people, Israel, and he's basically telling them that he had called his people, remember he called out a nation unto himself, he called out Abraham, the father of faith, he called Abraham out and declared to him he would make him a nation and a great people, and he would give him a son, he would multiply the seed of his son like the stars in heaven and the, the sands of the sea. He would, he would multiply them and he would make a great nation, and that nation would know God and he would pour his spirit upon them. He would teach them and instruct them through the giving of the prophets and the teachers to the people. And here he's declaring to the people that here he was called them. He, he was ready to be found by them. He, he was actually ready to answer their prayers, but they weren't seeking them. They, they weren't calling upon him. They weren't praying to him. In fact, he says they end up being rebellious toward him. They, they end up going in the way of the world around them. They were seeking their own desires and will instead of God's. And so the Lord says, so I turned to a people that I didn't call. And I said to that people, here am I. Here am I. He made himself available to another group of people, the Gentiles, the rest of the world, if you would. And as we go through it, though, he declares that, yet I will pull out a remnant of my people. I will keep them. And I will forgive them. In fact, I will forget the things of the past that they've done. And I will focus on a future for them. And I was reading that, I thought, Lord, how you have done that for us how you've forgiven us of our past and how you would have us as your people to focus on the future that you have for us. And so we will touch on that as we look through these passages. But why don't we jump into verse 1 of chapter 65. It says, I am sought of them that ask not for me, I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me. Or another translation, here am I, here am I. It says, unto a nation that was not called by my name. There, there are actually two thoughts that are uh, in this verse that people have. One, that the Lord was ready, as I said earlier, to answer the prayers of his people, yet his people weren't praying to him. He was ready to be found of his people, but the people weren't seeking him. So what he did is he said, I will turn to a nation that I have not called, to the Gentiles, to, to you and I. And he said, and I will present myself to them, and, and I will declare to them, behold me, or here am I, here am I to this people that, that weren't called by my name. You see Paul the Apostle pick up on this in Romans, so why don't we just look briefly into Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Look how he begins here in verse 20. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. 
But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient, gainslaying people. To the very people that I called, to the very people that I instructed, they were the people that were rebellious. They were the people that I was ready to answer. I, I was ready to be found by them, but they did not seek me. I, I made myself available to my people, but they did not even inquire of me. He said they are a disobedient and gainslaying people. Verse 1 of chapter 11, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God didn't cast away his people. He had a plan to call them and call them after his son Jesus Christ. He says, I am of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not a cast away his people, which he foreknew. Won't you not what the scripture saith of Elijah when he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thy altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. God was saying, no, I've kept a remnant. I've kept a group of my people that were faithful to me. And I've kept them, and I'm going to keep another group. And I'm going to pour my spirit upon them. And they will come to a place where their eyes will be open. And so he goes and he says, even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace, a group of people that God will call. And he declares that. Look in verse 17 of this chapter. And if some of the branches, branches be broken off, and thou, you and I, the Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, with them partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. It, it, the Lord is the one who sustains us. He supports us. God was saying, I am done with Israel. I will keep a remnant, but I'm going to call another people, a people that did not know me, a people, you and I, the Gentile nation, to call us unto salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose again. And he goes on and he says, Will thou say then that the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in? No. It, it, it wasn't that, well, we're going to get rid of them because I like these better. It says, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standeth by faith. You stand by faith because you put your faith in me. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not, the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. If, if you stay faithful, which declares your salvation, he that endureth to the end the same shall be saved. As you continue on, it declares that the salvation took root, it's real, and you continue grafted in the vine, one of God's people. But it goes on and says, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. If they turn and put their trust in the Savior, if they turn and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, then those that were Jews are grafted into this vine and become part of his church. 
for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? That God will bring his people back. We will touch on this later in Isaiah 65, where he speaks more clearly of the remnant. So let's turn back to Isaiah 65. In verse 2 it says, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoke me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifice in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of bricks. They were involved in idolatry. But he goes on and he says, which remain among the graves and lodge in the mountain or the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things. Doesn't it sound like a witch's brew? You know, like, what's in there? Eye of Newt, you know, or something. Of abominable things is in their vessels that, that they conjured up their own desires and they were partakers of the things of their own imaginations. That, that whatever they wanted to participate in, they felt they were fine and okay and everything was good. Yet God says, I called them. I wooed them. I sent prophets to instruct them, but they wouldn't come to me. They walked in their own ungodly ways. So he offered himself to another nation, another people, the Gentiles, you and I, to receive him. And look what it says in verse 5. Which say, stand by thyself, Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. You wondered where that phrase came from. You think you're holier than thou, you know. Well, it's biblical. You know, it's, some of my relatives, that is the only scripture I've ever heard them quote. <laughs> you know? Kirk, you think you're holier than thou. Man, you're quoting the Bible. I love it, you know. But this is where it comes from. See, what was happening is that because they were called as a people unto God, you know, we're, we're Jews, we're, we're people called by God, yet they thought they could continue to live in their secret and even open sin and, and kind of believed, hey, I'm okay. I'm okay, why? Well, because I'm a Jew. Well, I'm okay because I am a Christian. I'm okay because when I was little, I asked Christ to be my Savior. Yeah, but how are you living now? What, what is the reality of your relationship? It, it's not based on what happened in the past or a title. It's based on a lifestyle, a relationship. And they thought, we're okay. And they believed everyone else, get away from us, we are holier than you are. We are a God-called people, and yet they were living in sin. Some open, some secret. And God said, I'm done. I'm turning to another group of people. I'm turning to a people that weren't seeking me, but I'm declaring to those people, here am I. I am ready to be found by you. They weren't seeking him. They weren't looking to him. But now he's turned and he said, here am I. I am ready to be found by you. And that opened the door for you and I to come in to accept Christ as our Savior and to be saved and born again and be part of the family of God, grafted in as we read because of what Jesus Christ did. So here he's declaring these things and he goes on, and, and we can look in verse 6. It says, Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, 
but I will recompense, even recompense into their bosom, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. This even recompense into their bosom means I will punish them to the fullest measure is what it, it, it actually is declared. That God's saying, no, I will punish them to the fullest measure. They, they continue to be haughty. They declare they're a holy people, yet everything about their life is far from me. They're not seeking me. They're, they're not praying to me. They're, 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 they're doing very little of the things that I've called them to do, and yet they feel they're okay. And, and they're not. They're, they're far from me. They, they're, they're not even close to me. He says they're, they have become, they are not my people, but I've turned to another people. And I've presented myself to them, and I said, behold me or here am I for them to seek after me. Now, he declares that he hasn't written them all off. He, he's letting them know that, you know, I haven't just written all the Jewish people off. In fact, in the next verse, verse 8, it says, For thus saith the Lord, as the new Y is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake that I may not destroy them all. If I see a little wonderful grape that I can extract and, and that will be precious and delicious and, and be in a place of, of that, that is going to be wonderful to me, I, I will not destroy the whole cluster. I will reach in and seek out that one. I will reach in and pull it and call it out onto myself. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritance of my mountains, and my elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell therein. Now he's speaking specifically, I believe, to the Jews as he's saying, my elect, my people, the people that I called by my name, the Jewish race, that they will come and they will be a portion of them that will inherit the land. They will inherit the land, they will keep the land, they will occupy the land. And he declares in that that they are the ones that I will call and will be saved. Well, we see Paul speaking to this, Paul the Apostle, that when he declares that God's not done with Israel, that all of Israel will be saved, we see him speaking of this remnant that God's going to call out. We also see that this remnant, though, they have to come in again through Jesus Christ. They have to believe in their Messiah. We find this unfolding for us in Zechariah chapter 12. If you, if you just turn, we'll read one verse there. Just go forward in your, in your Bible a little bit before you get to the New Testament, and you'll see Zechariah. And I'll, I'll read it if you, you know, I'll read it. In verse 10, it says, And I will pour upon the house of David, Zechariah 12, verse 10, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They, they will look upon their Messiah and realize it was Jesus. He's the one that we sent to the cross. But he's our fulfillment. He's our Savior. And they will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. They will be weeping because they realize we had rejected him. But now we look upon him. Now we understand that he is the Messiah. And God will call out a people, his people, from the Jewish nation 
They will be saved through their Messiah and ours, Jesus Christ. And they will be a people who will occupy the land. And this was never even thought of being possible hundreds of years ago because Israel was a scattered nation. But now we see such a literal understanding where Israel is back in their land, they're occupying the land, and I believe God will call out a remnant from the Jewish people that are going to be born again. Now, he already has started that. Paul said it. Paul already declared to us that he's a Jew and he was called out. But we see also a group that is going to be in the land called out as it was declared. So you can go back to Isaiah. Again, it says in verse 9, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and my elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and the valley of Achor a place for the herds to lie down in for my people that have sought me. And so he encourages us there. And it goes on and it says in verse 11, but they are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, and prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink, and that furnish the drink offering unto the number. Now that is kind of vague in the understanding of just those uh, words that are translated there, but if you go into the original language, you see that troop is actually the goddess Gad, it's the goddess of luck or fortune. And the other is the god of destiny, number. And what God is saying is that these people, my people, were seeking after the goddess of luck and fortune and after the god of destiny. Basically, he was saying, instead of these people that I called, instead of these people walking in my ways, what they did is they went after their own fortune in life. They, they, they laid out their own destiny, their own plan. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to live. I'm going to seek after my life. I'm going to seek after the things I want. I'm going to be busy for my own kingdom. I'm going to do the things that I want to do, and I'm going to see myself where I want to end up. And he said, they no longer sought after me. They no longer trusted in me to sustain them, to, to be their all in all. They, they, they were no longer content with the inheritance that I would give them. They, they were chasing their own dreams instead of walking in the calling that I have upon their life. They got off course, and they really were not my people because they were seeking their own destiny and fortune instead of seeking after me. And so God is, is declaring the, the relationship that he was having with his people. And I can't help but think, Lord, sometimes I'm in the mix there. Sometimes I chase after my own destiny instead of what you have for my life. Sometimes I seek my own fortune. In fact, I will relate it in a minute, but sometimes I seek to save my own life. But your scripture says, if I do, I'll lose it. In fact, let, let's look at the next verse. It says, therefore, I will number, it's a play on words of, of that destiny, I will destiny or destine you to the sword. You're seeking your own life, but it's going to be a life of death. It's not going to be life of fortune and luck and, and prosperity. It's going to be a life of the sword and of death. He says again, Therefore will I number you to the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called you, you did not answer. When I spake, you did not hear. But you did evil before my eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighteth not. You went your own way, he's saying to those people. You, you, you've gone your own direction. 
You've walked in your own counsel and, and after your own desires. And therefore, what you have sought after is only going to bring death. It, it, it kind of like, if I want to paraphrase it a little bit with Matthew 10, verse uh, 39, about if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it, but if you lose your life for his name's sake, you'll find it, that concept. It, it's basically this. If you seek your own fortune in life, you will lose it. But if you stop seeking your own destiny, you will find a real and meaningful, meaningful life with God. You will find a real life to live. If you, if you decide to seek after me, you're going to find a real life. But if you seek your own, you're going to lose it. And so he declares that to him. Let's, let's jump to verse 16. You, you can read the rest on your own. Let's just look at verse 16. I see people shivering. Is it cold in here? That's what I see. I'm like, everyone's cold. Huh. All right. I don't know why it's warm. <laughs> it's that cold, huh? I mean, it's warm. It's 69 in here. <laughs> I know. A few of us are like, that is great. It'll warm up real quick. Maybe it's, uh, while it's warming up, I'll do a little fire and brimstone, you know. <laughs> and you! Never mind. All right, let's continue. Verse 16. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Basically, he's encouraging them that instead of what you've done in how you were seeking after the goddess of luck and fortune, and you were seeking after the god of your own destiny, that if you're going to be blessed, now you've turned and you said, then God will bless me. The one that I'm looking to bless me is the God of truth. I want him to bless me. Instead of you trying to bless your own life by doing your own thing, you decided, you know, I'm just going to trust in the God of truth. I'm going to let him bless my life. I'm going to let him fulfill me. I, I'm going I'm to let him be the one that's going to encourage me. I, anything that I put my trust in and swear to, it's going to be by the God of truth. Anything I seek after is going to be by his leading, by his will, for his name's sake. It's kind of this turnaround of the people that God has called that are going to say, no, we've chased our own dreams, we've done our own thing, we went after all the gods around us, we, we walked in whatever we wanted to, but now what we're going to do, if we're going to get blessed, it's by God, because His blessing is what I'm seeking after. His truth is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for what He has for me. I want to see what God has in store for my life. I'm tired of just kind of adding God to my life. You know, a lot of people, they just kind of, they're, they're walking around doing their own thing and they just kind of add God into it. And here the people are like, no, no more of that. God is my life. We're, we're going to seek after him and he's the one that is, I'm going to attribute to my blessings and to the, the things that I'm pursuing. It's going to be because of the God of truth that I'm walking in these ways. And look what it says after it says, because the former troubles are forgotten and because they had, I had hid or they are hid from my eyes. God's saying, I've, I've delivered you. I, I'm not remembering your past. I'm not remembering the past mistakes. I'm not remembering the past things that you did wrong. I'm not remembering the past failures. I'm moving on. I'm going forward. I'm going to go forward with my people that want me, that are looking for me, that are seeking me, the people that I made myself available to and said, here am I. I'm going to go forward with them. And their blessing there is going to be, and they're going to know it, it's from me. 
because that's what they're seeking. So I'm ready to move on. God's like, I'm going onward. I'm going to forget the past. Let it go. I'm going to move on with you. Now look at verse 17. It says, For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former things are not remembered nor come into mind. When I read that, it blessed me because I, I kind of saw something that the way God was doing this is that he said, you know what I'm going to do? You know how I'm going to forget the past? I'm going to forget it by going forward in the new creation that I have made, the new heaven and the new earth. And I thought, Lord, there's some wisdom there. Because a lot of times the past and the hurts and the failures and the situations, they plague us. They're, 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 they're like a, a giant weight around the ankle that are constantly holding us back. And, you, and you're trying to shake free from your past or from past situations, and you don't know how to. And I believe in verses 16 and 17, there's a little picture here. And he says, I'm going to forget it because what I'm going to do is I'm going to look to the future, to the new things that I've created. And how is it also true for us that if we're going to really be free from our past, we've got to press forward. We have to. If you're really going to be free from the junk that is taking you down, taking you out, discouraged you, depressed you, hurt you, you can't do it by staying in it or reliving it. you got to go ahead. And he says, so I'm going to go forward and create a new heaven, new earth. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You're warming up now, aren't you? I know. When that kicks on, it really does warm it fast. Second hmm. Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. God has a, a new life, a new plan. Man, I, I know that some of you were hurt in the past and you still carry the scars. But you don't want those scars to be those determining factors of your future. You got to let them go. Maybe there's a lot of things we got to let go. A lot of the junk we just got to say, you know, I'm done carrying it. I'm going to let it go. I'm ready to move on. There's a whole new calling, a whole new plan. I'm a new creation. I, I, I'm not either the same person that, that made the mistakes or the same person that got hurt by other mistakes, other people's mistakes. I'm a new creation. I'm going to go ahead because God has a hope and a future. He has a calling. He has a plan. He has something for me to walk in. And I'm going to focus on the new things instead of dwelling on the past things. I'm going to, I'm going to start focusing on those new things. I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. I, I want to encourage others to move on. I, I, want to, I don't want to get together with friends and all we do is talk about the past hurts. I, I want to get together with people and start talking about the new things that God has. What's up ahead? What's the next thing in my life with the Lord? I, I want to be one that, that begins to bring reconciliation, bring people back to God, not allow driving wedges to pull them apart. I want to bring people to the Lord. 
to will wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. When I was reading that, and it goes on, it says, and now then we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. We are now ambassadors. I am now here to represent God. I, I want to come into people's lives and not remind them of all their past mistakes and hurts or even their sins that Jesus died for and shed his blood for. I want to remind them that they're a new creature in Christ. It, it, isn't that the most encouraged when someone comes alongside you? I mean, you can have either. You can have people that come alongside you and say, you know what, Kirk? You, you are really a bum. You know, you're just, you know, the things that you've done over the years. In, in fact, I have a few of them here. You know, and they hold this list out. Would you love me to read them? Oh, please, please, slowly, real slow, just read them. I can pick that kind of person to be or to hang with. Or I can pick someone or become the person that says, you know, it's covered by the blood of Christ. He forgave you. He forgave them. Let it go. Did you know God has a plan for you? Did you know you are a special person? You are called by his name. He has a purpose and a future and a hope for you. Man, let's look at it together. You know, there are some, so many cool attributes of your life that I just love. I mean, I wish I had some of the characteristics that you had. It blesses me, the things that you're able to do, the perspective you have, the humor you have, the joy. Man, I want some of that. It's contagious. You keep running in that. Yeah, I don't like those people. I, I'd rather the doom and gloom. No, you wouldn't. You want the people that are going to encourage you. Be ambassadors, encourage people. Let's go, let's press toward the mark, the high calling of God. Let's go forward in the faith. How do I shake the past? By reaching for the future you have in Christ. How do I let go of all the hurt? By grabbing a hold of what God has promised and who he is and let him lead you into the new things that he has for you. That's how you do it. God said to his people, I'm not going to remember those things but I've created a new heaven and new earth. And I'm going to focus on that. And that's the direction I want you to go. And that's the direction he wants to call us to. In verse 21, For he has made him to be sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is what he has planned for you. To be the righteousness of God, to become righteous and holy to have that new purpose in life. Man, don't live the old life with Jesus. Live the new life in Jesus. Don't just tag Jesus along and live out your old life and the load hurts. Go forward in this new life with Christ because he's got a new life for you. He's got something that he wants to achieve and bring forth into your life. And I encourage you, Reach your hand out and say, Lord, take me away from where I am and bring me into where you would have me to be. And you start looking for that and seeking that and, and don't get caught up by going backwards. You know, you, you're not going to get very far. If every time you get in your vehicle and the only gear you know is reverse or you just kind of park, you know, and sit in, in the problems, you're not going very far you got to put it in the drive and start going forward. So I encourage you, reach out for those things. Know that the Lord has already taken care of the old things. And when we go for communion, we have a time to remember and to reflect and remind ourselves, Lord, you've made it all possible by what you've done at the cross. That you shed your blood so that I can be free once and for all from the past and the former things can truly be passed away. I mean, what a, what a glorious day that will be in heaven when we get there and, and everything's brand new and the tears are wiped away.
But I know that the Lord would have his people start walking in that now. Start reaching forward to the things that are up ahead. And get your mind that my life is committed to the calling of Jesus Christ. And really, the people that chased fortune and luck and their own destiny, they didn't have a better life but those that seek after the Lord. That's where it is. Father, prepare our hearts as we go to communion. May you open up our, our hearts to receive and commune with you, to have fellowship with you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this time to remember what you have done at the cross. May you free us from sin. May you forgive us of unrighteousness. May our hearts be prepared as believers to receive from you as we break bread and remember the work that you've done. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
When Jesus was gathered with his disciples, he had said, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you. That even though he was facing the cross, even though he would be owning the sin of the men that he was gathered with, yet he desired to have fellowship with them. The fellowship that the Lord desires to have with you is great. He wants you to have time with him, to have those special moments with him. And he has gathered us even today for those such moments. And as we come together, let us remember what he has done. He has taken the bread, it said, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is given unto you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. we thank you. We thank you that you gave your body, that you became the sacrifice for sin, that you fulfilled the plan of the Father. And we're so grateful, Lord, because you did that, our sins can truly be paid for because you paid for them as you were at the cross. And we thank you for doing that. We thank you for who you are and love you. In Jesus' name. It says, and he took the cup and he passed it out and he said, drink it. This is the cup of the New Testament, the new covenant, a new relationship. Not, not based on the old past. You see, because the sin, the bread, represents the sin being dealt with. And the wine, the juice, represents the new covenant that we can now live in. And as we know about the blood of Christ, it washes us from all the sin of the past. And he said, so it's a new covenant. Enter into it. Come together with me. I got a, a hope and a future, a plan and a destiny for your life. Don't seek your own. Let me unfold the one I have for you. It's far greater. The one I have for you in your personal life, in your family, in your marriage, in your business, in every aspect, don't just add me in. Let me be your life. Let us remember what he's done and partake together. Thank you for the new life. Sometimes, Lord, I, I, I don't, I think I've just touched it, barely experienced it. But Lord, I truly want to experience it to the fullest. You declared about us, we, your people, that you've come to give life and life more abundant. that abundant life, Lord, that new life. May our hearts seek after it fully. And you have promised that if we seek, we'll find. If we ask, it will be answered and given. If we knock, you'll open. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you and praise you for what lies ahead in our walk with you. And we're so grateful that in this new life, this walk, you'd promise to hang with us forever. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we surrender to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's, uh, in front of you, there's some cup holders in the rack. You can put your cup there or just save it and throw it out when you leave. But won't we stand to worship the Lord together?
I just want to encourage you, guys are new creatures in Christ. <laughs> All right. And for my next trick. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you guys are new creatures in Christ. Old things are passed away, all right? So let it go. And move on. God's got great things in every area of your life, in your personal life, in your marriage, in your family, in your business, in your relationships with your Lord. Grab a hold of it and go forward. He'll lead you into that. Just seek him for it. And you'll be, he'll be found by you. Because he says, here am I. Behold me. Keep chasing after the Lord. When he calls you, he's not hard to catch. He's right there for you. If you need prayer for anything, we'll pray. Remember, pray for this Saturday because it's new for this uh, hygiene bank to try to reach the community. Keep that in prayer. Thank you, guys. God bless you, and have a beautiful week in the Lord. Thanks for coming. God bless you.